again, I didn't think BlackRock was even looking at this. And because over the last 10 years, we've seen filings come in, but they're always from these like, we'll call them the mid-tier issuers. Like there's the top five, and then there's like Fanec, Global X, um, ARC. Like th these are all legitimate issuers, but they're not in the top five, and especially not the top three, especially not the number one. So BlackRock filing is just like mind blowing. And they have so much going on. You just think like, and then Larry Fink, I you know, we all remember him like kind of trashing crypto like five years ago. So it made no sense to me. And so when I saw it, I was like, oh my God. So James and I quickly huddled and our odds of approval went from 1% to 50 instantly. Wow. Because wow. it was like, what does BlackRock know? This makes no sense. If any other issue file besides BlackRock, Vanguard, or maybe State Street, we're just not moving our odds. But BlackRock in particular, especially because you gotta remember in 20, March, 2020, during the COVID sell-off, the Fed moved in to help the markets by providing liquidity. What did they do? They bought fixed income ETFs to give the bond market liquidity and they BlackRock basically did that program for them. So, yeah. you know, you have, a, uh, some people call BlackRock the fourth branch of government. So like, this is a big deal. This company is a, I can't overstate it really how crucial they are. Largest asset manager in the planet. The BlackRock Bitcoin ETF coming in January is going to be arguably the biggest moment in the history of Bitcoin. That's a message out from Bloomberg ETF analyst Eric Balkenhaus. He's one of two analysts that have been covering and breaking down all the Bitcoin ETF developments. In his latest interview, he highlighted why the BlackRock Bitcoin ETF is essentially a stamp of approval for Bitcoin from the US government. He also believes that the approval of the ETFs is going to start a marketing blitz for Bitcoin between the largest institutions in the world. As to what dates he's looking for approval, January 8th, January 9th, and January 10th, a three-day window he believes all 12 spot Bitcoin ETFs will be approved. Make sure to stick around to the end of the video where Eric also comments on the odds and dates of approval for a spot Ethereum ETF. Also guys, only a small percentage of my viewers are actually subscribed. If you enjoy finance content, consider subscribing or liking the video. It's free and you can always change your mind. Now here's Eric Balkenhaus and his latest breakdown on the Bitcoin ETFs. I can't overstate it really how crucial they are. Largest asset manager in the planet. So anyway, they went to 50% and then we started to dig through why and, and then Larry Fink goes on Fox News or Fox Business maybe within like a week of that. And he starts calling Bitcoin like, you know, digital gold and it's the new thing. And I'm like, oh my God. So we stuck at 50 and we thought, okay. And then we thought he clearly is into this. And I, we then looked at their annual report and we realized he had a couple things in there that he was looking to do uh, that I thought were revenue generators. So I think BlackRock largely sees a revenue opportunity, but I also think they see a revenue opportunity, but a disintermediating opportunity. Like BlackRock is has a little vanguard in them. They do like to go in and disrupt. And I think they see that uh, the crypto trades, the crypto exchanges, um, A, are, are expensive and B, after FTX, can you trust them? You know, and that was something they saw probably. They're like, hey, we can make it safer and cheaper. So they saw we can be the good guys and make good money while we do it. And I, I that's what they saw. I remember they had pushed ESG for like four years and like it, it died because what uh, oil stocks went nuts in 2020 and like so all esg etfs are like underweight oil stocks and they all underperformed and like the bloom went off the rose and, and now they're seeing outflows and esg became a political football so blackrock kind of had a loser with esg and so i think they see something new they can sort of like rally around in terms of an etf revenue generator because you have to remember BlackRock is a publicly traded company. They have a stock, they have shareholders are trying to please. And so this all factors in, I'm sure. Uh, they may not say that, but it has to be part of their calculus. But you know, um, they're in business. This is, and they see an opportunity. So nothing wrong with that. So anyway, they launched and then other people followed suit because they did. And then we started looking at the Grayscale case and we were like, wait, if Grayscale wins, this could really, maybe BlackRock, this is like a call option. In case Grayscale wins, BlackRock will be right there. So then we had all these theories on like BlackRock being there so the SEC could like hand them the keys and not Grayscale. And anyway, long story short, Grayscale won their case and our odds went to 90, um, you know, by, by the first final deadline, which was January 10th, which is coming up. 
and we're still there. And so, but to your point, BlackRock was a shocker. And then the Grayscale winning, we only had a 40% chance. So even that was a bit of a shocker, although 40% was pretty reasonable. And they won. And so I think those two things really got us on this trajectory up to 90%. And then the bigger, the, the final thing that was huge was seeing and hearing back channel that the SEC was engaging. You know, saying, here's our comments on your prospectus. Because up until then, and your 10 years, the Winklevoss twins started it. Every time we had these cycles, it would be like 10 filings and then radio silence, delay. Radio silence, delay, and then radio silence, denial. This time we heard there's no radio silence. They were talking to the issuers, giving them comments. Then you saw the perspectives coming in, updated, updated. That was major and that justified our 90%, we thought, because you just aren't, that's normal. And so normal was a break from the pattern. The radio silence denial thing is abnormal. So it was a pattern of abnormalcy for 10 years. And now we have normalcy. That's a good sign. So that's sort of where we are now. And there's obviously some other little nuances we can get into. But um, we feel like now we're feeling pretty good that we stuck our neck out there. We were a little early and we were a little optimistic versus our peers and versus some other people. But, I, you know, we held the line and it looks like it's pretty good chance they, they will be approved January by January 10th. Because the first couple of weeks are crucial. If if one of them looks like it's gathering steam, even if that money comes from internal or somewhere else, or you set it up ahead of time, it doesn't matter. It still shows up at volume and assets. If one of them looks and has the appearance of being the winner, that speaks, that's a major marketing help. Because the appearance of having assets, even if it's fake assets, like you put your own money in there, doesn't matter. It looked winnerish. So if one... Uh, one could make the greatest case on earth, but if it doesn't have assets or volume, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have like stank on it. And it's like a party. An advisor is going to look at it and go, I, you know, I just don't want to be the only person at that party. And we, we struggle with this because in other categories, the first ETF launch typically still has the most volume. But like over the years, so many better versions have come out. And we're trying to explain to people sometimes that, hey, try to get out of the rut of just going to the most traded one. Because you, there's all these new versions. It's like using the iPhone one still, and but that's just the way people operate as ETF users. They just tend to go to ones that have the money and the volume. I feel in the advisor world, you feel some protection. It's like, hey, I I'm in the biggest one. How could you possibly get mad at me versus this thing you never heard of? So I do think that it is very important to that get out early with some assets and mojo. Again, um, so I put those at kind of my, Invesco is also a big issuer uh, and they have Galaxy working with them. Uh, like I said, they're all launching at the same time. So this is going to be a marketing war, I think, like we've never seen. Um, I just saw Google uh, loosen the rules on advertising on Google um, because of this. So they said they now they had some kind of a ban. Now they're loosening it. And if you were a, if you are a uh, structured fund or something, you are allowed to advertise. That I'm sure that's because BlackRock and others called them and said, we're ready to spend millions on advertising on Google. That's my guess. Um, yeah, I would be very careful trading around this uh, for sure. Um, and I, I tell people like, sometimes we'll put a we'll put a, uh, put a tweet out with some updated filing and, and someone won't understand the, the wonkiness. They'll be like, green or red, just tell me. I'm, not, I'm, not just like, I'm like, dude, I'm not playing this game. I don't know. My guess is that the, like you said, the volume will be underwhelming after Bitto. Because remember, Bitto launched in a mania. October 2021 was a mania. It was like Beetle mania, but Bitcoin mania. So that's gone. The thrill, all the mania is gone. And those little retail investors, they're either using Coinbase or they're just once bitten, twice shy. I don't need a crypto anymore. So those, those, all those minnows that bid on Bitto the first day, I don't think they're in the, in the lake anymore. What's in the lake though underneath is these bigger fish, these advisors. And they're not just, they don't rush to the bait, okay? They're going to swim around it, look. So the good news is the bigger fish are there. They're hard to catch and they don't bite early. So you're probably going to see a lot less volume and assets early. Again, though, we will see enough to see which ETF gets the mojo, but it's over time, over a year, two years, three years that I think we see somewhere 20 to 40 billion uh, yeah. in this category. 
If you wow. extrapolate the spot Bitcoin ETFs in Canada and you extrapolate them to the size of the US market, you get 70 billion in the US. If you extrapolate Europe, you get to 30 billion. So we're kind of in the middle, 45, 50 billion is where we think the US market will be after a couple of years. And then maybe it inches up to 70 billion. That's right where gold is about. And that puts you at 1% of ETF assets. So that's our general estimate. But because advisors are the bigger fish who are going to swim around a little bit and wait to see which one's successful, which one's cheapest, uh, they're, but once they bite, they're big. So that's the good news. So I think we're going to see incremental big bites from model portfolios and advisors, but they don't, they're, they're not going to rush in the first day like we saw with Bitto. Again, Bitto was like throwing a bait and, and there's just like a million minnows just starving. Retail could come back. It could be there. But again, at, in October, I just, it was a mania and it was largely unvarnished at the time. It yeah. was just all good. Even if people, at, you know, at some point, the price of Bitcoin though will create FOMO like it did last time. But I just don't think we're there yet. And, and we, you know, we've also seen it because the Bitcoin mining ETFs to track Bitcoin mining stocks, they've been up well over 100% this year and barely any flows. And usually those would be used by retail. So I'm not saying they won't come around eventually, but um, I've lived through both. And to me, this, this feels a lot less like um, unmet demand sitting there from retail like we did back then. It just doesn't seem like it's on everybody's mind or lips as it was. Um, so, but, you know, we'll see. Like I said, I don't think none, but I just don't think like 2021 October was, um, it was a special time. I, I think minimal. Um, and, you know, the Ether mm. Futures ETFs launched, they really kind of, um, nobody cared. Um, and I yeah. think the question, we know they don't, it, people, look, people don't like futures, especially advisors. Like they don't want derivatives. They'd rather have spot. Right. But even the Bitcoin futures ETF has action. I mean, it still trades like, let me see what the, I mean, the trading volume on it's very good. It will dwindle once the spot launches, but right now it's the only game in town. It trades $300 million a day. It's very good. Um, so nobody really using the Ether futures ETF. That's probably a bad sign for like the what comes next crowd. You know, would a spot Ether do better? Probably it would do better than the futures, that's for sure. But how good would it do? I think for most advisors, and again, no normal people who are not into this that much, I think Bitcoin's plenty. Yeah, uh, I think they're largely going to go around Bitcoin. And you do have some pretty big advocates in your world saying, you know, like Sailor, there is no second best. You know, you have people out there, right? So there are people from within your world that are like, yeah. you don't need anything else. And so, um, but like Matt Hogan, who's someone I trust, who's, you know, he's from the ETF world, but is pretty much embedded in crypto now. He thinks Ether is a bigger deal than Bitcoin. Um, I don't know, but... Even with him saying that, I, I know, like, if I'm a, for my regular person, if I'm just sitting there and thinking my own personal account, I'm probably thinking, you know what, honey, just buy a little of this Bitcoin, it, that, it'll move with Ether, they're all the same, it's good enough, it's the one, we don't need to go crazy here. That, that's sort of, I think, how most people are going to play this. So there's ETF analyst Eric Balkanaus on the potential impact of the BlackRock Bitcoin ETF. His perspectives offer a unique glimpse into what could be a monumental moment for Bitcoin and the broader cryptocurrency market. The anticipated approval of the ETF, seen as a significant nod from the US government, may well set the stage for an unprecedented marketing race amongst the world's largest financial institutions. But that's not all. Balkanaus also sheds light on another exciting development in the crypto space, the potential approval of a spot Ethereum ETF. His analysis of the odds and projected dates for this approval adds another layer of anticipation for crypto enthusiasts and investors alike. Anyway guys, hope you all enjoyed today's video and that provided you with some value. I'll see you all in the next one and as always, all the best.